um, when I was asked to give this talk, I didn't know what I was going to talk about. And then I started um, thinking about Norway, and which naturally read to led to some reading uh, on the Vikings, and then I knew what I was going to talk about. <laughs> so, my talk <laughs> so my talk today is the story of the, the Kuiper Belt. The story should appeal to many people because it's a, a story about exploration and has a happy ending. But it might appeal particularly to Norwegians because the Norwegians know something about exploration. Um, with its long coastline and rugged interior, it's understandable that uh, Norway has produced many explorers. Probably the best known of them all is uh, Roald Amundsen, the first person to reach the South Pole in 1911. Um, but I also learned recently from my reading that uh, he was also the first person to sail through the Northwest Passage, the waterway linking Europe with Asia. And this was a imp imp very impressive feat, but then as I read on, it became obvious that Amundsen was just continuing a tradition of a long line of ex Norwegian ex uh, explorers, the Vikings. Um, well, the word, word Vikings usually brings up visions of big men in horn helmets and raiding the, the, the coast of Europe. And, but to my surprise, my reading revealed a much more complex character of the Vikings. Reports of the Viking attacks almost all came from uh, reports from churches and monasteries um, because they were the main victims of the raids because they're the ones who had uh, all the wealth at the time. Um, so although the reports were, were undoubtedly true, they, they only told part of the story. Less biased reports would have indicated that, that the Vikings were also settlers and traders. Um, and they started their explorations a long time ago, back in the eight, eight, around the year 800, when the rest of uh, Europe was still in the medieval ages. They established commerce between uh, Europe and Scandinavia. They settled I Iceland and Greenland, crossing the ocean in modest uh, little boats, kind of like this one. So we all have heard of, of Leif Erikson, probably the first European to set foot in North America in the year 1,500 years before Columbus arrived. Um, so the, the, the main point is, is that the Vikings were fearless explorers. They headed into the storming North Atlantic Ocean in small open boats, risking their lives for new horizons at the time when most of the world was unknown and unmapped. So um, we were particularly honored that the dis their descendants are giving a prize to us for exploring the outer solar system. Um, I was lucky then when I, when I started uh, working in astronomy, I had the opportunity to work with somebody almost as brave as the Vikings and fortunately much less violent. <laughs> and uh, <laughs> I, I met Dave Jewett at the right time when he was pondering about the outer solar system. And this is how the story happened. Unlike many astronomers, I, I did not study astronomy as an undergraduate. I was not a, aware of astronomy at all at the time. The project that I worked on as an undergraduate was mostly in the basement, surrounded by vacuum pumps. So I, I, I no windows. So I was utterly unaware of uh, heavenly bodies. So after graduating from Stanford, I worked at JPL very briefly. And as you probably know, the, the corridors of JPL were filled with beautiful images of solar system bodies. Um, and so for the first time, I became aware of the contents of the, uh, the, the solar system. So I asked a friend of mine who were the lucky people who get to study these beautiful images, and he told me about something called planetary science. And so this revelation stuck in my mind, and when it was time to apply to graduate school, I applied to the planetary science department at MIT, and then I made the switch. So when I arrived at MIT, I seeked out Dave Jewett, um, looking for some project to work on, and he told me the problem that he was thinking about. Um, his question was, why were the outer region of the solar system so empty? The inner solar system, roughly speaking, the region from uh, Mercury out to the orbit of Jupiter, contained the terrestrial planets and lots of comets uh, uh, and asteroids. But beyond Jupiter um, lay basically only the giant planets and the oddball uh, planet Pluto. So as Dave saw it, there were two possible explanations for this apparent emptiness. But well, one of them is maybe, well, maybe the, the <coughs> outer regions were really empty because the giant planets were very good at ejecting things, and so they had maybe cleared out everything in the region between them and beyond <coughs> them. Um, computers of the 1980s were not fast enough to confirm this idea, so we didn't know, and so this was a, a reasonable hypothesis that we could not discard. And the other possibility is that maybe um, there were many outer solar system objects, but they were just too faint for detection because solar system bodies, you can see them only because of reflected sunlight, so they become very faint very quickly when you move them further away. 
So now Dave was not afraid of faint objects. In um, 1982, while still a graduate student at Caltech, he had used one of the first CCD cameras to recover Comet Haley when it came back. Now Haley at the time was about four years before perihelion. It was uh, beyond Saturn. It was still very faint, about 24th magnitude. At that time, it was by far the faintest solar system object ever seen. Um, so he figured that if he could see something as small as Comet Haley uh, uh, beyond the orbit of Saturn, so maybe he could see other things too. So he told me his idea of looking for uh, objects in the outer solar system, and being a stupid graduate student, I said, sure, why not? So <laughs> but then how are we going to find these distant things? Well, at, at first we thought that the best way to do so was to use uh, occultations. In occultation, a solar system body passes in front of a background star and it blocks out its light temporarily. Um, and we said, in this case, we say the star is occulted. So if you monitored uh, a star's brightness, you would see a line like this. So these are stars that uh, were in occultation, occulted by asteroids. So we, for example, you see this star, the brightness stayed roughly the same. And here's when the occultation occurred the star dimmed, and then after the asteroid had passed by, the brightness goes back to normal. So this is what you would see in an occultation. And we would be looking for little blips in the star brightness like this to indicate the existence of distant objects. Now, but then the whippoorwills of Arizona quickly put an end to that idea, and whippoorwills are these birds. Uh, they live in Arizona, they live in other parts of the US. Um, their coloring makes them hard to see during the day, but uh, um, so they, they, you almost never see them during the day, but you can hear them at night because they're nocturnal and they're very vocal. And uh, this is how what they sound like. <laughs> okay. So this is what we heard all night long. <laughs> <laughs> um, so we were observing Kid Peak, Arizona at the time, and a disappointing phone call to the Audubon Society of Arizona revealed that occultations were not going to work. The real occultations were going to be too rare, too short, and too similar to occultations by whippoorwills. So we had to come up with a, a, a new plan. <laughs> so, well, having no predictions of what we were looking for, we decided to use two methods for our search. First, we would, use, we would photograph uh, large patches of the sky using photographic plates on a Schmidt telescope. And this would allow us to find the, the bright things with magnitude limit about 20. Um, at the same time, we would use CCD cameras on a 1.3 meter telescope to look for the, the fainter things with limiting magnitude about 24. The main advantage of photographic plate is that they're big. Um, the ones that we used covered, had an area about uh, um, 25 square degrees, which was about the area about 100 full moons. So that, that was quite big. And so here's a picture from the Harvard College Observatory back in 1891. These women were basically, the, they were the computers of the day. They had to examine all the photographic plates. Um, uh, in contrast, CCDs were uh, much more sensitive, much smaller. Here's a typical CCD. They're about 100 times uh, more sensitive, but they're also about 1,000 times smaller in area. So we thought that by using these two methods, we would be able to use a plate to find the, 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 the rare, bright objects, and we use a CCD to find the more abundant, faint objects. And so that's, that's at least that was, was the plan. And we would distinguish faint, uh, nearby object from distant object by their speed. Distant object would move more slowly, and then based on this, because of using this speed limitation, we name our object the Slow Moving Object Survey. Every sky survey now is done with CCD because CCD these days are very big. <coughs> and an example of this is the, this is a CCD camera of the uh, University of Hawaii Panstar uh, Telescope. And this has 1.4 billion pixels. In contrast, the original CCD that we use had 512 by 12, 12 pixels. And comp in comparison, it's about the size of the little red dot. So it was a radical idea to use uh, CCDs to cover a big, uh, big area of the sky. And I remember asking Dave, well, isn't it kind of crazy to do a sky survey with such a small CCD? And his answer was, if we don't do it, who will? <laughs> so. So. Or whether with photographic plates or CCD images, the technique to find moving things is the same. You look at a sequence of images very rapidly in success succession so that any object that moves would jump out. Uh, very easily. So this project is, this process is called blinking. For the photographic plates, you, uh, we returned to Kid Peak to use the, the, the um, plate comparator, which was a machine that allowed you to look at two plates, uh, uh, one after the other, uh, very rapidly, much like 
the way people use uh, Tombaugh used to discover Pluto. These are the two discovery plates of Pluto, showing Pluto here and here. So we would stare at these plates and look at every single dot. We would do this for hours and hours and hours until we covered every dot under these plates. And the whole process was just so painful that uh, after the, our first uh, uh, year, we decided never to use photographic plates again. <laughs> so, <laughs> but <laughs> but it, it, with the CCD, it was, it's much easier, and I, so I just show you. So here, this is a, a sequence of images to, uh, of a Kuiper Belt object, 1990 Chaos 16. So as you can see, with CCD images, it's, it's, it's much easier to find, uh, to, 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 to blink. Okay, so at this point, I have to digress a bit and let you know history of what, what people were thinking about the outer solar system at the time. Well, the truth was hardly anybody was thinking about it. Forty years earlier, Edgeworth and Kuiper um, speculated that the solar nebula did not have a sharp edge at Neptune or Pluto, so maybe there might be a population of icy bodies beyond Neptune. Now, these objects would not be planet-sized because the collision time scale at such large distances was too long to make uh, large planets, but maybe they, you know, they would just be smaller. And Kuiper also erroneously thought that this population would be gone by now because it had been scattered away by Pluto, which he thought was a massive body. Um, but for both Edgeworth and Kuiper, these speculations were not based on any calculation or uh, any theory, so they were basically just guesses, lucky guesses. So Edgeworth and Kuiper's speculation went unnoticed for most of the time. Every so often, theorists would uh, bring up the idea of a, a, a comet belt in, in, um, uh, as in connection to the problem of the origin of the of comets. Well, the problem is the following. Comets are divided into two groups. They're the long-period comets, these guys with big, long orbits, randomly oriented. And since 1950, we know that the long-period comets came from the Oort cloud, uh, explained by Oort in 1950. And the Oort cloud is a big, vast cloud of comets, spherical in shape, about 100,000, 50,000 AU from the sun. At this kind of distance, the, the comets are susceptible to um, perturbations by passing stars and the galaxy, and these perturbations deflect the comet orbit and send them into the sun. In contrast, the short period comets, these are the ones that take less than 200 years to go around the sun. People didn't know where they came from. People thought, well, maybe they came from, they used to be long period comets, but this was uncertain and people didn't know. And um, so these people, every so often, they would bring back the idea of the, sh uh, the trans Neptunian comet belt, maybe as a supply for the short period comets, but we didn't know. We were unaware of most of these work when we started our survey, and then when, after we became aware of them, they still had very little impact on us because they didn't have any predictions. There was no prediction that we could test. There was no prediction as to how many things there might be, uh, how bright they might be. So contrary to what many people think, we were not looking for the Kuiper belt. We were simply verifying whether the outer solar systems were really as empty as it seemed. We had no preconception of what might be out there. If there were things, great. Um, if there was nothing, that would also have been useful to know. In 1988, they moved to University of Hawaii, and I followed them. And this, and we continue our work looking for slow moving objects at this telescope, the University of Hawaii 2.2 uh, meter telescope. For those of you who think of uh, the life of an astronomer is, is glamorous, <laughs> it's not. <laughs> um, a more accurate representation of our life is the many uh, long cold nights in a, 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 in a cold control room on top of a mountain in the middle of nowhere. Because of its altitude and its location, in the middle of the ocean, the air above Mauna Kea, where we observe, is uh, exceptionally stable and dry, making, uh, making a, a wonderful place for observing, but it's not pleasant uh, for humans. Besides uh, being cold, dehydrated, and uh, deprived of oxygen, um, there was also a lot of sitting and waiting. There was um, waiting for the weather to clear up. In contrast to the typical image of Hawaii, it does snow on Mauna Kea, and that's how he got the name, which means white, uh, white mountain. Or waiting for the long exposures to end. <laughs> so, Our search was also not popular. Um, telescope time committees and funding agencies did not look favorably upon ser searches for objects that were not predicted by anything. Our friends and colleagues kept asking us when we were going to quit, and we kept saying, soon, soon, we'll quit. <laughs> We, we acquired telescope time um, for this search any way we could. We usually, uh, usually by stealing. And, uh, <laughs> and you know, we would write telescope proposals for other projects, and then we would use some of that time for, for the search. And this went on for years. 
<laughs> and <laughs> um, in the meantime, CCDs got bigger, and each time we got a new CCD, we would say, maybe this time, this time we would we would find something. And these image pictures of us in the control room. This was before the discovery, and they look very grumpy. <laughs> and here's after discovery, he looked much happier. <laughs> okay. Okay, so in 1992, um, in the summer, there was a new camera on the, the telescope, a CCD with 2,000 by 2,000 pixels, 20 times more pixels than what we had originally. And the first time we used it, we found our first Kuiper Belt object, um, August 30th, 1992, almost exactly 20 years ago. And this shows the discovery images and the times of the observations are indicated here. Our strategy was to take four images of the same part of the sky, spaced out about a few hours. And uh, we needed at least three or four images to confirm the detection rate of any moving object because there were many artifacts that could mimic uh, slow moving objects like cosmic rays. And at the time we had just taken two images and, um, and Dave was blinking them on the, on the computer and while uh, waiting for the third image. And uh, I, you know, he liked blinking the two images. I didn't like doing that because of the number of false alarms, but he liked to do it. And uh, so a candidate quickly caught his eye. Um, the candidate was moving very slowly, uh, west and south, the right direction. It was faint, about 23rd magnitudes. So it was unlikely that anybody had seen it before, but it was bright enough that we knew it was not uh, due to noise in our image. But still, it could have been almost anything. And after looking for so long, we were, we were cautious. Um, then the third image came out, and the object was still there. The same brightness, still moving in the same direction, the same speed. And then the fourth image came out, and it was still there. So then that's when we knew it was real. Um, so based on the object speed, we knew to calculate its distance. It was about 41 AU beyond Neptune. Based on its brightness, we calculate how big it was. It was about 250 kilometers. We had covered 0.7 square degree by then. So we knew just simple statistics told us how many more of these objects were out there waiting uh, discovery. And this new object came to be called 1992 QB1. Um, and this shows the announce, announcement of its, its discovery. So the, the population to which QB1 belongs is now called the, the Kuiper Belt, even though he anti-predicted it. So. Um, a lot of people were skeptical about uh, our discovery. Brian Marsden, who was then the director of the, the Minor Planet Center, he made a $500 bet with us that QB1 was most likely a, a long period comet. And he said that was gonna be the, the comet of the century. Uh, he, he lost his bet and he paid up four years later. <laughs> <laughs> and other people told us that QB1 was the only one of its kind and that we were lucky. And this was blatantly silly because uh, simple statistics told us otherwise. But this criticism didn't bother us much because by now we were confident of our ability to find um, objects like QB1. And so sure enough, we found the next object at the very next observing run and from then on more and more at every subse subsequent observing run. And so by now, more than 1,500 Kuiper Belt objects have been found, the result of many searches carried out by many people. We now know that it's a thick <coughs> ring of bodies of thickness, about 25 degrees, extending roughly from Neptune's orbit out to about 1,000 <coughs> AU. We estimated about 70,000 objects, but, uh, larger than about 100 kilometers, then hundreds of millions smaller objects down to one kilometer, and several uh, Pluto-sized bodies have been found. Um, and the Kuiper Belt has yielded plenty of surprises, and I won't go into them in that because that's Dave's talk, but I'll just mention one surprise. Um, this plot was from uh, one of our early papers, 1996, only four years after the first discovery. At that time, we had found about 30 objects, and here we found that the semi-major axis and eccentricity. Um, and these long, skinny brackets are called resonances, <coughs> and their names are indicated up here. So here, like the three, five to three resonance, three to two, and so on. Um, the object in the resonance have a special dynamical relationship with, with, with Neptune. Um, the most <coughs> famous inhabitant of the 3 to 2 resonance is Pluto, marked here with a red cross. If I noticed that if I hadn't marked Pluto with a red cross, you wouldn't be, have been able to, to, to pick it out. Um, being in 3 to 2 re resonance means that Pluto completes two orbits around uh, the Sun for every three orbits by Neptune. And similarly, something, say, in the 2 to 1 resonance would mean that these objects would make one orbit around the sun for every two orbits by Neptune. So these are very precise mathematical configurations and they have special consequences. For example, you know that the uh, Pluto crosses the orbit of, of Neptune, but thanks to the uh, resonance dynamics, the two bodies never collide. And so the same protection holds for all the other objects in the three to two resonance. So these objects in the three to two resonance 
um, for which we call Plutino to emphasize the dynamical similarity with, with, with Pluto, they're, they're basically identical to Pluto in terms of orbits. So in my mind, this, this plot, more than any argument about size, proves very clearly that Pluto is uh, more usually used as a Kuiper Belt object. So as Pluto's planethood became more precarious <laughs> with each new discovery, many people became upset about the prospect of Pluto's being um, Pluto's loss of planethood. Some people felt betrayed by astronomers. They said, well, we were once told by you guys that Pluto was a planet, and now you, know, you say this isn't, so why should we, we believe you now? Well, the obvious answer is, it's our job as scientists to break down old ideas and we replace them with new ideas when they fit observations better. This is called scientific progress. Um, other people, including astronomers, told us that um, Demoting Pluto would be uh, disrespectful to Clyde Tombaugh, who discovered Pluto, to the public, and disrespectful to children who, they, who like Pluto. Uh, <laughs> well, we don't want to hurt anybody's feelings, especially children's, but uh, science does not depend on the public's or children's feelings. So in short, all data clearly reveal that Pluto was misclassified as a planet. It's a large but otherwise unremarkable Kuiper Belt object. Pluto's origin lies firmly in the Kuiper Belt, it's best understood in the same framework as other Kuiper Belt objects, and it was time to make this clear to the public by changing its label. So um, the Vikings started the European tradition of exploring the world back in the 9th century. In the 15th century, the rest of Europe caught on, and they sent out a series of explorers to map the world, establishing contact between con uh, different continents. I like to think that um, that we as 20th and 21st century astronomers are following these explorers' footsteps in expanding the boundaries of our, our solar system in searching for new extrasolar pla planets. We are mapping uh, the universe and we're making um, the connection between our solar system and the rest of the galaxy. And uh, I hope that we will find hospitable new worlds, maybe even establish contact between Earth and uh, the other planets. But until we find them, the next hospital planet, uh, we shouldn't forget this one. That's it.